first Ember Camp in London, and it's really amazing to, to be here with you all today. Um, it, it is our, our honor to be the first to welcome you to Ember Camp London. I usually say that all my keynotes, which are closing keynotes, so it's actually just true this time, not really a joke. Um, all right, so let's dive into it. Usually at the beginning of these keynotes, we like to give a little bit of update about the community. And we've heard you loud and clear. Ember's stability without stagnation, our policy of stability without stagnation is just not very exciting. Our RFC process gives you almost too much insight into the changes coming. And that's why today I'm excited to announce the newest member of our core team. Uh, you may be familiar with him. His name is Boris. <laughs> so we think that the trend on the web is clearly, uh, on mobile devices, is clearly towards more web apps. With technologies like Service Worker and push notifications, the mobile web is becoming a first-class app platform in its own right. And I think as we saw happen on the desktop web, once you reach a certain critical mass of functionality, users just tend to prefer the shareable, installation-free web apps. They just end up being a better user experience. And we think of Ember as being the SDK for the web. It's all the tools that you need to build these kind of great web experiences. Uh, Ember doesn't want to be the platform, uh, we, and we don't need to port a native platform to the web. What the web is missing and what native platforms have is an SDK that helps you manage complexity as your application grows and helps you package and distribute your app optimally to your users. Uh, and we, what we want to do here is we want to build a solution that doubles down on the strengths of the web. Uh, we want to focus from the bottom up on building a world-class web application. And we like to say that web applications are not just good enough, they actually have real advantages that are good for real users. Uh, we say that Ember is a framework for building ambitious web applications, uh, but what I want to do today for a bit is talk about what ambitious web application means in the context of a mobile web application. Uh, so on desktop, when we say ambitious, usually what we mean is a long-lived workspace application. And what that means is that people are willing to wait for a few minutes, or a few seconds, to, for the application to load. A few minutes would be ridiculous. <laughs> uh, a few seconds for the application to load, because using the app is their primary activity at the moment. So something like Gmail or the Heroku dashboard, uh, people are willing to accept a little load time if it gets them a snappy, productive UI afterwards. Um, but the idea of a long-lived application basically doesn't exist on mobile. Uh, mobile is for quick interactions. Very few people are sitting down for an hour to work on their Android phone, even on native apps. And that fact alone should really give the web an advantage, because the web already places a premium on instant interactions. Uh, you get what you're trying to accomplish without an install step. Now, that said, an optimal mobile web application has basically three phases. First, we deliver raw content, just the HTML, just the content that you're after, um, ensuring that those on slow connections or people whose JavaScript ha didn't happen to load yet get what they're after as soon as possible. Um, the next thing that we do is we load the minimum set of JavaScript needed to add interactivity for that page, keeping transfer time and parsing time low. And once the user has an interactive page that they're interacting with, we can start preemptively loading other parts of the application, including frequently accessed data. Uh, therefore, after that, subsequent visits and interactions are in nearly instantaneously be instantaneous because they don't rely on the network. That is sort of the optimal story. That's the story that people want to, to do, accomplish when they're trying to build mobile applications. Um, unfortunately, building an application that takes this optimal approach has historically been very difficult, and mostly you hear about this from people who are building demoware on the internet. You mostly don't see a lot of real applications being built this way. Um, and the reason for that is that there are sort of two camps uh, that try to tell you what is the correct way to build an application. Uh, the first one is the progressive enhancement camp. Uh, progressive enhancement, if you do it correctly, gets you the first two phases. Uh, you get the content part, uh, just as HTML, and then you get the interactivity afterwards layered on top. But this approach inherently relies on server-side rendering, me meaning that any kind of network flakiness makes interacting with the app feel slow, if it works at all. Um, you also have to manually separate the behavior and presentation, rendering HTML, and then manually wiring up JavaScript after the fact. And because of this complexity, a lot of developers prefer the experience of using frameworks like Ember, Angular, or React to write progressively enhanced applications. Uh, it's just too many details to get right by hand. On the, other, on the flip side of that, um, we have the, the need to have resilience, to have all of your JavaScript loaded for subsequent interactions. And on the desktop, that means that you have your workspace app up and running. You have downloaded all the JavaScript, and now a user can interact with it. On mobile, this doesn't mean that you're living inside the app, that you have your workspace app up and running. What it means is making subsequent interactions that you, that you get to cold as fast as possible by running them right on the device, rather than having to communicate over the often unavailable or slow network. 
Now, phase one and phase two and phase three all have real benefits, but getting all of these things right at the same time is very tricky, and basically nobody has the uh, experience, time, or resources to pull it off. And this effectively has caused the world, like I said, to become polarized into two camps. The lightweight JavaScript people who say that instant load times are paramount and they ignore the bad network scenario, and people who favor developing native applications which are willing to take a hit on initial load time and uh, with multi-megabyte app downloads, sometimes as much as 100 megabytes of app download, but once you get the application on your mobile device, you get the resilience that you expect from the phase three over here. So unfortunately, what you often end up with is a very compromised user experience. So here's a concrete example I can show you from uh, just two days ago. I sent Yehuda a link to uh, my Foursquare app. I was trying to tell him to come meet me for coffee. And so what happens is when you tap this link, you, you get the Foursquare mobile app, but it actually pops up this interstitial telling you to download the app. And then you try to download it, you get an error. And now we're sent to the App Store. And in the meantime, all I wanted to do is get the address so I can put into yeah. Google Maps and meet Tom. Yeah, he just is like, I, let me come meet you. And he's on relatively slow uh, internet because he's traveling. And so we open up the App Store. We start downloading it. You can see this takes quite a while. This application is actually like 29 megabytes, and people say Ember is big. And then once we're finished installing it, which takes quite a while, now I'm going to go back to my Hangouts app, tap the link again. And the irony here, OK, so I'll open the app, verify it works. But of course, it has lost that intent. Right? It lost the intent that I was trying to view this particular business. So I go back, and I say, let me try tapping that link again now that I have done as they asked me to do and installed the app. And the irony here is that actually, it just delivers a very, very nice mobile web app. <laughs> and so now I tap it. It integrates with my system. It opens up Google Maps app for me, and it's very nice. And this is the experience I should have had. That's this what I wanted in the first place. Right. This whole flow wastes valuable user time. And for what? Someone believed that the fact that a native app was a superior experience, and in particular, it has these re-engagement uh, properties like push notifications, the fact that it's on the user's home screen, um, they thought that that, made, that was justification enough for interfering with the instant load that we're used to getting on the web. But the question is, what if we could somehow design a programming model that didn't force us to make this trade-off? So the benefit of an SDK for the web is that it knows how your app works top to bottom. So you can write your app once in this very declarative, modular way, and Ember can create different versions of your app from the same code. Now, probably many of you who have used Ember are already familiar with this idea. When you're running in development, we create a version of your application that has assertions enabled, that has better uh, error messages, and in general, it's designed to help you as a developer fix bugs. But you don't need all of that stuff when your users are running it, because it makes the application slower. So we also do a production build that minifies everything together. It uh, lets you fingerprint assets to put on a CDN. It concatenates, it gzips. All of these best practices that you don't have to think about to ensure that when it's actually consumed by your users, they get the best possible experience. And most recently, we added this idea of Fastboot. So you install the Fastboot add-on to your Ember app, and now when you do a build, it's actually producing two versions. One version designed to be sent to the browser, and another version that's designed to be sent to this Fastboot app server running in Node.js. And that's without making any changes to your code at all. Right. So single code base, no changes. We've now derived three different versions of your application. And again, just a single add-on lets us do that. But this is just the start of the possibilities for what we can do in terms of creating these optimized experiences. So one thing that we're working on now is more sophisticated slicing and dicing. For example, we can examine precisely what features you use and automatically trim code for the features you don't use. We can also figure out what code is needed for just that particular route that the user is visiting right now. We can render it on the server, and then we can stream the rest of the application out to the user only once they have a fully interactive page. You could also, for example, automatically determine what CSS is needed by the components on that page and generate just the critical CSS for the user when they land automatically. And uh, later today, Martin will be giving a talk on Service Worker, which you should definitely check out, to get a taste of the experimentation going on in the community right now to deliver these instant experiences where the tools understand the entire app, and they automatically give you these performance benefits without you having to understand fully how they work. 
And Eric is giving a talk on CSS experimentation that should allow us to do more slicing and dicing in CSS as well. Um, there's an analogy that I like to use here, which is if you ever built native applications like for iOS or you know, with C++ or something like that, there's a, a different set of settings that you can use. You can say minus O3, you can say minus OS to get optimized sizing. Right? So there's these different settings that you can use to tell the compiler to give you an optimized build for specific environments. But usually when you build the whole stack yourself, if you build it from the ground up, you're not actually thinking about all the different ways that you might want to slice and dice your app. So maybe if you're lucky, you have development and production if you took the time to build that. But the idea that one single code base can give you many different outputs really is dependent on having a single programming model or a single, a single language that knows how to build these slice and dice targets. So basically what I think of uh, here is that Ember is GCC minus O3 for the web. It allows you to say, I've written a single code base, and then I will give you an optimized build for the specific environment that you are talking about. Um, by giving developers a single modular co uh, programming model, and the modularity is important here, it's important that you're not just writing one big giant file with a bunch of global variables, um, you get all of these three modes, the content, the initial interaction, and the resilience of getting your whole JavaScript, uh, JavaScript application from one code base without having to think about which environment you're in. Uh, because we have a conventional structure for how applications boot all the way to the life cycle of when they're torn down, we can break your app up into pieces and serve it to the browser just in time. And that means you don't have to manually split your code up or write any of this infrastructure yourself. It also means we can run in other environments like Node.js pretty easily. So I want to ask you all a question, which is, what is Ember for? What kind of things do you build using Ember? And what kind of things would you not use Ember for? So let's talk about the desktop. When it comes to building desktop web apps, what's Ember for? There's an age-old argument about the difference between web pages and web apps. But I think in reality, we mostly agree there's kind of a continuum between those two. But all the way on the left, let's say we probably have something like a landing page. Now, a landing page doesn't have multiple pages, so you don't need a router. It's a single page, single page app. You probably don't need services. And Ember data is probably not going to get you very much. And I think most people would rightly say that Ember would be overkill for a simple landing page. On the other hand, there are things that are unquestionably apps. And here, people actually tend to use Ember a lot. They know that they're building a sophisticated app, and they know ahead of time that they're going to need all of the things that Ember provides for them. So uh, there's a f many examples. Here's just three, the Heroku dashboard, the Square dashboard, and the Travis CI interface. Um, and these are all what we call workspace apps. So the definition of a workspace app is one that has basically the following characteristics. It's typically behind some sort of authentication, although not always. Uh, oftentimes, it, if these were to be indexed by Google, that would be not a feature but a bug, because it would violate your privacy, because now Google is indexing all your email. Uh, it's usually used for at least a few minutes at a time, sometimes hours. And so load time can be a little bit longer, because it's, that value is amortized over, let's say, half an hour. Also, visitors tend to be repeat visitors. You can count on many of your users at least having many of your JS assets warm in their cache. And because they have so much functionality, they tend to be worked on by larger teams. And, and actually, Ember wins a lot here. But unless you know that you are building something like this, people tend to view Ember as overkill. So um, these are some tweets that I found kind of illustrating this sentiment. And I think these people's analysis of the situation is, is not wrong. I think this is a correct analysis. Someone saying, so Ember and Angular are clearly overkill for my requirements right now. I need something in the middle. Or I prefer React and Flux. In my uh, humble opinion, Ember is cool and a complete framework, but also too bloated for the same reason. And on mobile, this phenomenon is exacerbated because of significantly tighter hardware constraints and more importantly, because there is really no such thing as a workspace app on mobile. So the opportunities that people to get to, get to use Ember are significantly reduced. And often, Ember gets disqualified for pages simply because of its payload size. And even for apps on the mobile, because of the importance of load time in the mobile context, large file sizes can completely disqualify you. So. Uh, one thing Malta Ubel said, who is uh, the project lead on the AMP project, he has identified that on many phones, on average, uh, on a phone, one kilobyte of JavaScript is equal to about one millisecond of UI thread stall. 
So for example, if you have a 200 kilobyte payload, that means on average you're going to see about 200 milliseconds of delay, which isn't so bad, but now, now you have a megabyte of JavaScript, and that's like a second of delay. So that's bad. So what can we do to mitigate this? And how can we make Ember apps load instantly on mobile devices? I'll let Yehuda talk a little bit about some of the ongoing work that they've done to deliver improvements on mobile performance today. So for the past, probably, uh, I've been working on, on an app for the past couple of years, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. But for the past, probably 18 months, a lot of what we've been doing has been laying infrastructure groundwork for things that we can do next. So for example, Glimmer 1 itself was mostly laying infrastructure groundwork that we can, do to, that we can use to make Glimmer 2 a thing that actually improves performance. Um, engines, which are a great feature for teams that teams can use today to be clear, clear about the boundaries between, across their teams for a single application, uh, we're going to see is going to lay the groundwork uh, for uh, lazy loading engines, which I'll talk about as well. Uh, props to Dan Gebhardt for doing a lot of this work. Um, ES6 modules, which is a thing that we adopted a couple years ago, is actually pretty important for making, for having tools that understand what the dependencies across all these files are. Um, and uh, we standardized the syntax for ES6 modules a couple of years ago, sort of in anticipation of eventually being able to do more dead code elimination. Um, and finally, Fastboot, which today is mostly useful for like SEO or, or uh, static pages, it has been is a good laying the groundwork for doing even more stuff on the server stuff similar to what Tom talked about before. So like I said, I've been working uh, with a team at LinkedIn for the past couple of years uh, to build their mobile application. So about a year ago, a year and a half ago, I don't, I don't act, so about two years ago, they made the decision. They started maybe like 18 months ago. Uh, LinkedIn decided to build a mobile application in Ember. At the time, I said, what are you doing? You should build your desktop app in Ember. Mobile applications in Ember don't really mesh that well. But basically what happened was that they had an existing backbone application, and the backbone application worked well for the small team that was working on it, but they very quickly reached the limit of how many, uh, and how many features and engineers they could put on this application and also maintain good performance. Oops, sorry. No. Sorry. Um, so they, had, they were basically had these very tight performance requirements that came from their existing mobile application, and they also had a bunch, they wanted to put a lot more engineers on this project, and there were no frameworks that they saw at the time that were both fast on mobile and also designed to scale to big teams. So the decision that they made was that the best bet was to start with Ember and try to make Ember competitive from a performance perspective rather than to take another framework and try to make it more like Ember. Um, so the thing, about, uh, the thing about LinkedIn is that they actually test on a wide range of real world devices with their real applications. So for example, they test on the Samsung Galaxy S3, which was a phone that was released in 2012. They always tell me, quote, you can still buy it at Walmart, which is like Tesco or Carphone Warehouse or whatever. The point is you can still buy this phone in a store for whatever reason. And so LinkedIn actually tests frequently on this device. And I have to look at every single day how Ember is performing against a phone that was shipped four years ago. So we have a real understanding of how Ember performs on quote unquote real hardware, as people say. Um, as part of getting the app into production, like I said, a couple of years ago, Ember was not a good fit for mobile applications. The LinkedIn team has made a bunch of changes to the way that they package and deliver their Ember application. Um, so for example, they uh, have moved a lot of their uh, modules to strings so that you can evaluate them lazily on demand. They also have uh, moved to eagerly loading common modules to try to get all that stuff to happen all ahead of time instead of interspersed with the execution of their code. Uh, a bunch of other changes to sort of just how the application itself gets, re gets packaged. So this has nothing to do with changing anything about their code. It just reorganizes how the Ember payload is packaged. And that actually produced a net 25% real world improvement, not in the rendering time, but the end to end performance. So on a very slow phone, maybe it might take like, let's say 10 seconds to load a, an Ember app, a very old phone. And that's like a two and a half second improvement just by reorganizing the packaging. Um, and so the cool thing about how LinkedIn works is that they don't want to be maintaining their own custom fork of Ember forever. They're in the process of extracting string modules, eager loaded modules, and reorganizing their code into engines and lazy loaded engines. They're in the process of extracting all that stuff so that all of you can take advantage of that without having to be a company the size of LinkedIn. And I think that's really the promise of Ember's, uh, how Ember works, which is that there's not one company that runs it. There's a lot of companies that are all taking advantage of each other's work, and everybody feels uh, the ethos of trying to extract things out into the world. So like I said, optimizations of 25% end-to-end -end for mobile simply by reorganizing the payload. And like I said before, 
uh, a lot of the things that we did over the past 18 months have actually been foreshadowing things that we can do that will make very significant improvements. So Glimmer 1 maybe didn't give you an amazing performance boost, but it laid the groundwork for Glimmer 2, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, engines on their own are more of an organizational principle, but engin the engine's programming model was designed with the idea that we can make lazy loaded engines, which is coming pretty soon and which LinkedIn is already experimenting with. Um, JavaScript modules on their own are just a nice programming model. They actually improve the programming of a JavaScript program, but they also allow us to do more tree shaking, more uh, what we sometimes call svelte builds. And finally, uh, Fastboot, while maybe you think of it as something that is mostly about delivering HTML to your, to your users, making the visit API, which allows you to, under the hood, uh, visit a page in Node, allowed them to not render HTML to their server, but just figure out what uh, HTTP requests will be made and just prefab the HTTP request and not do anything special with server-side rendering. So these are all things that maybe in your app today don't have any obvious performance improvement, but LinkedIn has used all these underlying things that we worked on for the past couple of years to already start getting some very significant performance improvements in their application. Um, for me, since we shipped Glimmer 1 uh, last August or, or July, I've been spending most of my time working on a ground-up uh, re-architecture the rendering engine called Glimmer 2, and I want to talk about that just for a moment. Um, basically, when we built Glimmer 1, we built something that was a nice, fast primitive under the hood, and we were able to get good benchmarking results, but as we started to add more and more uh, Ember stuff back into Glimmer, 2, Glimmer 1, as we started to make it more and more compatible with Ember, performance started to slip, and in fact, performance on initial render time of, uh, initially regressed, so we actually got worse performance uh, for a lot of applications from Glimmer 1. We got much faster updates, right? So any update was always like, could be like 10 times faster, but initial rendering initially was slower. And so we, ba the, basically the problem that we had was that Glimmer 1 was this little engine that was quite fast, but then the view layer core, basically what part of Ember is considered the core of the view layer, actually had all this other Ember stuff on top. And that Ember stuff wasn't that well integrated with Glimmer itself. So we basically added all this stuff on top for compatibility, and the result of that was that we ended up with a not amazing, uh, not amazing performance for the whole unit. So if you pulled out Glimmer 1 on your own and used it, that's great, but it's actually pretty hard to use because it only has a small subset of the, whole, uh, of the whole Ember. And for example, Glimmer 1 had no component model at all, right? So in Glimmer 1, if you want to use a standalone, you have to build your own component model. Whereas the Glimmer 2 idea was to say, okay, what if we can take the view layer core and make it a standalone library that includes all the stuff that you're used to? And that includes things like, I said, like the component model, right? And that basically allowed us to take the whole performance perspective into consideration when we built the core and make sure that when we started to integrate Ember, we're not going to see massive performance uh, regressions. And what's happening with Glimmer 2 right now is that the work is happening in Canary. You can d download it right now and check it out at your convenience. However, please make sure that you run a production build. Uh, Glimmer 2 actually has even more error messages, even more assertions than Glimmer 1. So if you run a development mode, it's quite possible that those, all those assertions in development mode will slow down your app. Make sure that you do any benchmarking in production. But this work is already happening. Uh, it's already in Canary. Um, and Glimmer 2 progress, you can check out. This is the uh, pre-flight checklist for, uh, for Glimmer 2. Uh, it's actually, we're getting down to a small number of things. And hopefully, we'll soon ship an alpha of Ember that contains the Glimmer 2 engine. We're getting really close. Um, it's not gonna, we're not going to go that feature right now because of the fact that 2.8 LTS is coming right now, and we would not want to ship a whole new rendering engine in an LTS release. That would seem ridiculous. So we're not going to ship uh, uh, Glimmer in 2.8. Um, so perhaps in 2.9, depends a lot on how people's testing goes once we actually start shipping alphas. But we're pretty excited that an alpha build that is, you know, you can just drop into your app and test your app is, should be coming pretty soon now. Um, Glimmer 2, as a, as a feature, is very exciting in terms of the rendering performance that it gives us. Uh, but I want to turn it over to Tom to share you, with you a project that he's been working on using Glimmer 2. So um, I, I want to show you this project I've been working on for the last few weeks. This is an app that we're building for the company I work for called Monograph. And this is an application that is designed to be shared on social media by celebrities, politicians, and other people with a social media following. Um, this is what the app looks like. You can visit this URL. It's online. You can check it out right now. Uh, please, I invite you to try it on your phone. Uh, we call this an MCAST, and it's designed to deliver this instant loading, native feeling app on the web. So this is a, an app for soliciting donations uh, for Hillary Clinton, and it plays this, uh, this auto plays this video full screen, and then uh, a few seconds into it, what we do is we pop up this little, sorry for Donald Trump, uh, 
So we, we didn't elect them yet. Yeah, we didn't elect them yet. Uh, so we pop up this little screen, and you can scroll. And what you can see here is that I can donate to the campaign without ever having to interrupt the video that I'm watching. And so this is just one example. This is not an official thing, although we are pitching this to the Hillary campaign. This is just an example of an MCAS that has been configured to collect donations uh, for Hillary. And the thing about this app is that it only has one page. So a router is overkill. The only data that we have in is the streaming video. And the only data we have back out are our analytics libraries and the Stripe API. So Ember data and other services are kind of overkill. Um, and this is really designed to be used. The, the big reason we wanted to use this is because it's designed to be used in the context of a social media application like Twitter or like Facebook. So the idea here is that we can go places that native apps simply can't go inside a Twitter or a Facebook web view and still have this very native-like experience. So we knew that for that goal, the most important constraint for this app was load time. It had to be as close as inst to instant as possible. And, and really, Ember is just too big for this use case. But at the same time, uh, we didn't want to give up on the productivity we were used to. And I'm sure, as, as probably many of you have experienced, once you get used to that productivity boost that the Ember ecosystem gives you, going back to roll your own feels very painful. All this work that you forgot that you used to have to do, now you're having to do it by hand. So here's how we built it. We started with Ember CLI, because it's the best build tool that we know of in this space. We pulled out Glimmer 2. And we didn't use Ember.js, and we didn't use any jQuery. So this was a raw Glimmer 2 application. And because we leaned heavily on Ember CLI, tapping into the ecosystem was really easy. Um, we were able to take advantage of the performance work that had already been done for us. So for example, in this app, we used the Broccoli app cache plugin to automatically generate an app cache manifest. And that's literally one line of code in our Brock file. Uh, we also added SAS compilation for a CSS, app cache support, like I said, and we were able to transpile it into TypeScript with just a few broccoli filters. So it was really remarkable how quickly we were able to compose all of these different pieces into a real production application using Ember CLI. And what's nice about this is because it's so slimmed down, we get really good time to first paint even on older Android devices. So this is like on a Nexus 7 uh, running Chrome on a simulated mobile 3G network. Which is like a three-year-old device. Right, pretty old. Um, so RUM first paint is half a second. Just to give you a, a more visceral sense of what this feels like, here's the video from webpagetest.org. Um, remember, this is a few years old Android device on a simulated 3G connection. And so we see usable UI in about a second fully rendered in under three. And this is without any server-side rendering, which is an additional optimization we are interested in exploring. So I told my boss that I wanted to use Glimmer 2 for this project, but uh, even I knew that was a risky proposition, because no one had really done this before. And Glimmer 2 was designed first and foremost as a way of speeding up existing Ember apps. It wasn't really designed to be used standalone. And so I told him, OK, listen. Let me hack on this. And if I can't build a working prototype within a week, we'll just abandon it and use something else. We'll use React or Vanilla.js or whatever. And so thankfully, after a week of hacking, I actually did have something working. The, the broccoli stuff, like the build script, that was actually the easiest part. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised to discover that not only was it fast, we actually hit our payload size target. So, our payload uh, for this app with, with Glimmer 2 is 39 kilobytes, and React just by itself is 44. And another thing that's pretty cool about that is that 39 kilobytes includes the app and Glimmer 2 under the size of React by itself. So one thing to note here is that a big part of React, of course, is event handling, which we don't end up needing in this application. And uh, Yehuda and Godfrey are working on even further file size optimizations to Glimmer 2. This is basically the non-optimized version, but we think we can get this file size down even smaller. And what's cool about this is that once all of this infrastructure was in place, I was working with uh, my, my teammates. Um, and we had an experience that, while it was significantly pared down, it would feel familiar to any Ember developer. So my teammates, uh, Will Bagby and Hassan uh, Abdelrahman, were able to quickly add functionality. Like, here's an example of Apple Pay support in iOS 10 that we added. So you just tap this, you pop up the screen, and now you can make your donation using just your finger, which is pretty cool. The web payments is going to be huge. It's almost scary how easy it is to spend money on the web with this stuff. 
Um, and when I say Ember-like experience, here's uh, an example of a handlebars template from our app, and I think that this would look familiar to most people in the audience. Um, so we've been working hard on real apps that have to run on real mobile devices. So uh, my experience from extracting Glimmer from Ember was a very manual process, but I think it shows that smart enough build tools should be able to do that kind of code elimination for you, automatically producing file sizes if you use fewer features. And over time, I think Ember is going to become more pay-as-you-go. So uh, I'll let Yehuda explain what steps we're taking to ensure that all the apps that you've got today can benefit from these improvements. So remember that our goal here is to let you write one Ember app, a single code base, and let Ember create optimized versions of the app. Uh, the initial content without any JavaScript at all, the smallest JavaScript payload that you need to start up interactions, and background loading your entire application once the interaction is started up for better network resilience. So what are the steps that we're going to use to get there? So first of all, we need a way for every unit of JavaScript to clearly state its dependencies in order to reliably tree shake the initial load. And as you know, your Ember application already uses ES6 modules, already declares its dependencies using ES6 modules. Um, but in order to take maximum advantage of this technique, we have to use JavaScript modules everywhere throughout the ecosystem, such as all these packages that we use internally in Ember. And the work to transition Ember's core and dependent modules is ongoing. It's been ongoing for some time now, and it's proceeding quickly. Um, Another thing that we've done here is uh, we've used TypeScript in Glimmer 2. Glimmer 2 was the first Ember project written in TypeScript, and it really demonstrated its value for core parts of the, of the code base. Um, there are two major advantages that we got for Glimmer from TypeScript. The first one is that the, types, the type system made it easier to define clear public interfaces as an API pretty early on. With, while still retaining the ability to iterate quickly and refactor. So we were able to say, you know, we're not going to hard code this piece of code to this other piece of code. We'll use an interface. But then if we discover that we need a different interface, type, TypeScript and Visual Studio Code allow us to quickly find all the places that are using that old piece of the interface and fix it. And that allows us to use more interfaces and fewer concrete classes, which makes it easier to write code that can be easily pluggable. Um, and the type system is also pretty aligned with the, requirement, the performance requirements of modern JavaScript VMs, making it easier for us to encode requirements into the types that cause us to avoid common deoptimization foot guns. Um, and so basically, these two things together make it a lot easier for us to build things like standalone, uh, standalone Glimmer in a way that performs very well and is also pluggable in uh, whatever environments without having to worry about the things that have historically made big monolithic libraries the, way, the normal way that you build tools like this. Um, you, if, now, since you're looking at a TypeScript slide, you might be wondering, so TypeScript and Ember, what's the story with that? Especially since you know Angular has really bet hard on TypeScript. And we definitely want people to be able to use TypeScript, TypeScript in their applications, but we are going to continue to design Ember as a JavaScript-first framework, and we want to make sure that JavaScript is forever the happy path for building Ember applications. Um, so TypeScript itself, of course, has the philosophy of being a gradual type system, a type system that you can add to existing JavaScript code bases to get more rigor. And Going TypeScript first is kind of the opposite of that philosophy, right? It says you use types first. We want to use TypeScript for what it's good at, which is adding gradual typing to parts of your code that you think could benefit from types. And that's how we're going to think about using TypeScript going forward. Um, I've also been working uh, in my work on TC39 very hard to standardize cl uh, more stuff in classes and decorators in JavaScript. So today, here's what a component looks like in Ember. And the, re the fact that it looks like this means that there's a effectively a whole object model that you have to download that Tom's code didn't have to download because he didn't use the, the Ember object model. Here's what a component looks like today. Um, and here's a hypothetical version of the component refactored to use JavaScript classes and decorators to write the same thing. Um, Robert actually has a, a plugin today that you can install to get something uh, similar to this. But clearly, this is still speculative, and the decorator feature is still uh, experimental in JavaScript itself. Um, by moving the object, as much of the object model as possible into the language, not only do we get to remove huge swaths, huge swaths of code once you migrate to the new syntax, so I don't mean we're going to delete this code from Ember. Of course, it's important that you have a migration story. But in the sense that we can remove code that you're not using, we can start removing the object model once people migrate, once your app migrates to it. But it also means that app developers are more likely to be familiar with the code that they're looking at already instead of looking at a whole new thing that is the Ember object model. Um, like I said, this is going to be an incremental change. We're not going to break your apps, and, and we're going to make sure we, you have a story for moving piecemeal to the new syntax. But I think this is definitely the, a story going forward. So despite all of this, I think that there's kind of an elephant in the room, which is that even if we make the file size of a simple app tiny, 
people still feel overwhelmed when they're learning Ember. So if they succeed in learning it, they usually love it. But a lot of people don't even bother trying because it feels so intimidating. Often they just get dropped in the deep end of this API surface area, and they feel like they need to understand everything just to get something simple done. And, and I just think that when you give someone an abstraction and they don't understand it, it's actually worse than useless because that makes it much harder to learn, and they feel like they're fighting against it. And so the solution to this, typically, the proposed alternative to this, is kind of like a build-your-own-framework approach. So we say we're going to start with a small core, like Backbone uh, or React, and then we're going to layer on the abstractions as you need them. And this feels really great at first, but it has some real shortcomings. First, you have to integrate these disparate pieces yourself. And that glue code that bridges these different libraries can really add up when they aren't designed to work together. And it gets worse the more libraries you throw into the mix. There's kind of this combinatorial explosion of complexity. And second, when you have too much variation in how your apps are architected, you can't actually build automated tools that slice and dice and optimize, optimize your application in different ways. It would be like asking GCC to compile and optimize your program when every app was written in a little bit different syntax. So React, I think, is obviously used by more sites than Ember. But I would bet that Ember is more popular than any particular permutation of React, Redux, Flux, MobX, and the other various libraries that you end up using in practice with React. So for example, let's look at what one hypothetical web app stack might look like built using the build your own framework approach. So we're going to start off by having a build tool. right? Everyone needs a build tool for building a modern web app. Now we're going to add React, because we heard that's pretty good. Uh, but we also heard that React is just a UI. It's just the V and MVC. So we're going to add some state management using Redux. Uh, we need to add Redux storage to store our state, I guess. Um, now, of course, we want to take advantage of the latest features in JavaScript, but we need to support older browsers. So we're going to throw Babel on here. And of course, we want to get the best performance out of our app. And we all know what the root of all evil is. So we're going to add Immutable.js. Uh, next, we need to add routing, of course, because we have multiple pages. So we'll throw a React router in here. Uh, that doesn't actually communicate out of the box with Redux, so we need to wire these two things together. But thankfully, there is a module for that that does that for us automatically. Uh, we need to internationalize, obviously, and support many different languages. So we'll act, uh, add a React INTL in here. Uh, we need to add server-side rendering to support Google and to make our pages much faster for our mobile users. So we'll add Express for that. Um, we'll add Format.js here. I forget what Format.js does, but it's definitely it's important. related to info. Ah, yes, formatting dates and stuff like that. OK, so that's great. We've got our app. Uh, also, we'll need to add React Helmet to make sure that we can uh, put our React components into the head. We'll need to add a Gulp plugin for our favicon. Um, we'll need to add Raven.js. I think this is for testing. Um, short ID to generate these client-side IDs. Of course, uh, we, our designers are writing their CSS and SAS, so we'll need to add that. And then we'll need to add Auto Prefixer to make sure that this works across browsers without having to add these, uh, add these prefixes. So that's pretty good. And then you know what? Um, we'll add Mocha for the tests. And we'll add Bluebird for the promises. And we'll add validator.js just to make sure uh, that our forms are valid. And then we need to make sure that the code we're writing is legitimate, so we'll throw ESLint in here, which is great. And then you know, why not? We'll just throw in Webpack here to help bundle <laughs> up uh, all of our files and our modules. And then we need to make sure this runs in the, uh, the server, uh, so we'll add uh, Webpack isomorphic tools, I believe is what the scientists call it. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, he's just trolling. No real app would actually end up with something like this. Uh, but actually, this is based on a real React boilerplate I found called Este. And if that is not to your liking, if you feel like that's too big, uh, I also found that there is a site that aggregates all of these different React boilerplates available. And uh, this, is, this is a great resource if you're getting started. Uh, it has a ton of stuff on it. Um, in fact, there's actually more, but Keynote has a maximum animation distance of 10,000 pixels. So this is all you get to see. And actually, this one's my favorite. It's just like, at that point, you've just given up on life. This one's going places, I think. It has 57 stars. Yeah, it's blowing up. OK, so this is not to, to pick on, on any of these projects. The bottom line here is just that it's nearly impossible to build tools that can optimize the delivery of an app when you have this much fragmentation in how they're architected. So being able to deliver these different versions of your app at different times to kind of bend the curve of trade-offs between progressively enhanced web apps and native apps 
requires that the tools understand everything needed to make your app tick, from rendering to app initialization to data fetching. And that's why all of the work that we've done as a community to build shared solutions is so important, because any of us can improve a piece of Ember and be confident that that change will reach the rest of the community. And that means that we can build higher together. Instead of technical debt, this is almost like technical compound interest. But we understand that not everyone wants to start with the full Ember stack. And so it's a major goal for me and Godfrey to make Glimmer as a project easy to use as a standalone library, optionally with Ember CLI as Tom used it. Um, there are many use cases for this, from writing reusable components, cross-framework UI components, to incrementally retrofitting older server-side web apps that cannot be rewritten. Um, we can let people enjoy the benefits of Glimmer, but most importantly, as your app grows, we'll have a cohesive community-supported path from standalone component to page to app every step of the way. So there's kind of an interesting thing happening, I think, which is that React is focused on this kind of radical simplicity. Uh, in fact, I hear people describe React as not even being a library for building web apps. It's kind of a library for describing UI components that happens to have a DOM adapter. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have Angular 2, which describes itself as a platform of capabilities, supporting JavaScript, TypeScript, Dart, cross-platform development uh, with, React Native and uh, with React Native and NativeScript integration, a new CLI tool, a new data library, a new router, built-in RxJS observables, and, and more. And so for the first time, Ember is positioned in the middle of the field. That's never happened before. And we're not trying to solve the problem of cross-platform app development. We're just trying to give developers the most pragmatic solution for building apps on the web. We think of Ember as being the SDK for the web. It's all the tools that you need to build great web experiences. And we don't want to be a platform. We want to be an SDK for the platform you already love, an SDK that helps you manage complexity and helps you deliver the instant-on experience users expect. In other words, we want to build a solution that doubles down on the web strengths. We believe that web apps are not just good enough, they have real advantages over app store encumbered applications. We have a productive, well thought out framework with a vibrant community, all of you. Uh, we don't need radical change or to try to turn Ember into the dominant paradigm for writing apps for all platforms. What we need to do now is to focus on speed, size, getting new developers started, and reaching new audiences that couldn't use Ember before. Uh, me and Tom have always said we want to build a framework that would last at least a decade. We're about half a decade in now, and we could not be more excited about the future of Ember and the future of the web. So what I would say to all of you is let's all build higher together. Thank you very much.